So I'll say a couple of words before Malcolm MacIver introduces our speaker. He's there, Inigo. So the idea of this series of talks is kind of to expand your brains. Uh, there is going to be a series of talks. Some of them will be by art historians, or sorry, historians of science. Uh, there is one by the former chair of the philosophy department. Uh, we will publicize the list very soon, okay? But speaking of philosophy, okay? The kind of books that I really like are books really small like this. And actually, the book here is only a third of this. And it's by a fellow named Georg Hegel. So how many of you have taken a course in philosophy? OK, fantastic. Uh, so when uh, Sandy Goldberg comes here, he probably will ask that question because he's the chair of the philosophy department, so we'll ask that. Um, so I'm mentioning this, oh, parenthetically, Malcolm McIver, who is a professor in biomedical and mechanical, his first degree is in philosophy. Okay? So uh, many years ago, that would have been unthinkable. Everybody who was a professor of mechanical engineering had all the degrees in mechanical engineering. So it will be clear why what kind of elements Malcolm brings into the picture by being, having this unusual background. But why mention Hegel? So the, the book in here is called The Philosophy of Art. Okay? So two minutes about, because Inigo is a real modern contemporary artist. And some of you have come across people like this, but many of you have not. So for a long, long while, art, was not associated with the genius concept that we see today. The, the art was associated with techne, the word technology comes from there, and art for the Greeks was lamp with techne, a craft. Okay? Took a long, long while before, with a romantic period before artists emerged as what we imagine today. But what we imagine today is kind of not right. Because many of you will equate art with beauty. Okay? And I mention Hegel because Hegel was the first person who argued that beauty in art was on a higher plane than beauty in nature. Okay? But he was also the person that for reasons that were not completely his own, um, brought something that people attributed to him about the end of art. Okay, some people took that. And by that, I mean that at some point, art, which we see really order in courses in art history, okay, you see period after period, at some moment, there are so many bifurcations that it's much easier to talk about what is not art rather than what is art. Okay? So, the whole point of this, I'm bringing someone of Inigo's caliber here, is to kind of stretch your brains by challenging you to ideas that may be really different to some of you. So with that being said, as a way of intro to all the, the lectures that we're going to have here, they are all within the intellectual space of what is in a good university, like Northwestern. But if we don't force to hear someone from the philosophy department, we'll never hear. But this is the opportunity. You are here, that's what that's we want to achieve. So with that being said, I'm going to give the mic to Malcolm, who will do a proper introduction of our speaker. Thank you. So uh, Inigo is a conceptual artist whose multimedia works challenge notions of the political and the cultural. His current work re regards the inversion of utopia, the fabrication of war, and the hypersonic reentry of modernism. He is a recipient of a 2001 John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Award, 
and a 2009 Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Um, Manglaro Avale has shown his works all over the world, including the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, he is a professor in the Art Theory and Practice uh, Department. Uh, so I recently had a chance to get to know him a little bit better as we discussed a new class that we are, thank you, uh, that we are putting together for this spring, uh, which I invite you to check out. Um, this is a collaboration. This is a fourth or fifth class now in a collaboration, ongoing collaboration between McCormick Engineering and the Department of Art Theory and Practice. This year, I have the pleasure to work with Inigo. Uh, so we had a meeting at his home, a uh, gorgeous home um, designed by his brother, who's an architect. Um, and, and we quickly converged on some common areas of interest and concern. It turns out that we're both uh, very interested in phenomenology, which is uh, this kind of weird corner of philosophy that's, I don't know, almost absurdist. It sort of contemplates uh, the structure of subjective awareness. Um, so we're both uh, very interested in that part of philosophy, and we're both very concerned about climate change, um, something a little more concrete. And so we're going to do a class that sort of synthesizes uh, elements of, of those interests and concerns. I'll just read for you the, the blurb we drafted together. Um, so uh, we inhabit and think within a bubble of space and time, the shape and size of which is rarely an object of thought. The first multicellular animals bubble, 700 million years ago, extended only to the body's surface. With hundreds of millions of years, our, our event horizon has been pushed out to what we do in the next few minutes and days. Now we need to not only vividly imagine but also care about more distant horizons. How can we bootstrap our imagination to do this in art and science? So this class will emphasize experiential art. It is also informed by cognitive and perceptual science. So that's um, the topic of the course. If you're interested, we'll probably do admission by permission number. Just email an ego and myself. Uh, I think it's going to be a huge amount of fun. So during our conversation, an ego described his approach as including elements of confounding people and seducing them. Uh, and this, this makes sense to me on a number of levels. Um, to take confounding first, I think one of the reasons that uh, Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, two uh, preeminent phenomenologists, have had the impact they've had is that what they express in words is so big and open that it, it invites you to sort of insert your own philosophy into their work. And this reminds me of a quote by the a uh, horror novelist, Stephen King, who said, the way to write the scariest uh, scene in a book is to leave as much as possible to the imagination of the reader, because only they can come up with what is really scary to them. And so I think a great artist, perhaps a great phenomenologist, provides a scaffold for you to build, with, uh, to, for you to build what works best for you. Um, and as for seduction, this is obviously a key element of good art too, but it's very hard to sort of capture that in, in words, uh, for me, it includes a sense of awe and admiration and a resistance to the purely prosaic interpretation. In any event, Inigo lives his philosophy. A, a, as I found by the end of our meeting, I had been both confounded and seduced. And uh, so let me offer that, uh, that you uh, get that effect as well. And welcome Inigo to tell us why, on this precipice of numbing polar vorticity, why we don't need a weatherman. I have a, a... Thanks. Um, am I on? OK, great. Thanks, Malcolm. And thank you, Julio. Um, art theory and practice has been in conversations with Julio maybe five years ago when I first came to university. And, uh, and um, there are a number of projects that we want to engage that sort of pit art and engineering together. And uh, one of them are the courses that the Malcolm uh, spoke about. And, and others are just uh, dialogues uh, such, as, such as this. And um, <clears throat> so this is, I guess, the whole uh, brain lecture series, right? And I thought I'd give you a picture of what I think my brain looks like currently. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's, it's actually working. It's actually telling you which way the wind is blowing, you know, regardless. But, you know, well, you know, 
my brain. Well, it's a brain, you know, so it has its flaws like any other, uh, any other brain. Um, but it's uh, an image that I, that I love um, because, uh, I, you know, I've been working with issues of climate and weather uh, for quite a while. Um, and, and I've been concerned about something getting uh, busted. But I'm not an engineer, so I'm not, you know, suited, nor is my role and purpose to actually fix something. But maybe as an artist, what I do most often is I just point, right? I just point to a thing. Um, and then, um, or, or create a situation so not only I can ask a question, but so more importantly, the, the public uh, can ask a question. Um, I know that when I was coming out of my uh, graduate studies um, um, back in 1997, um, 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 I, um, I was using or just beginning with unconsciously to think about, uh, to think about climate um, in regards to an issue that was very important to me. 1997 was when in the U.S. we actually began to talk, have a, a beginning, a debate uh, about um, a fence, which is now a debate about a wall, right? So in 1997, I went to uh, Nogales, Arizona, and uh, Nogales, Mexico. They're right next to each other, so you can literally have one foot in Nogales, Arizona, and another foot in Nogales, New, Me uh, New Mexico. One foot in Mexico, one foot in, in the U.S. And uh, um, and uh, I'm not sure that situation is possible right now, at least not where this picture was taken. Um, so, and I went there just simply to sort of point the camera up to the sky. And I, I wanted to catch clouds crossing the border. I wanted to catch it kind of like a phenom the phenomena, a natural phenomena, sort of in complete disregard to that uh, political, uh, political border. And, uh, and I came back a number of years to actually film, uh, film, film the work and uh, found um, uh, at that particular day, found a particular really interesting phenomena happening right above our heads and that's a kind of a wind shear event. And that event is where um, the wind is actually moving in different directions or in cross directions at different elevations. So what I had, or the camera had, uh, that captured at that moment was a series of clouds moving north and a series of clouds moving south at the same time, right? And that, um, and I'm not sure at that point that I knew what was going on. Um, wind shears are usually some sort of portents to a calamity, a storm, a plane crash, right? And, uh, but I captured this and it, it seemed, I just liked the moment that, that uh, the, of clouds moving north and south and south to north. Um, and of course, since I didn't know anything about weather back then, uh, I didn't realize that what was going to come was the storm. And so the storm came and we had to shut down, uh, shut down filming. I then took that, uh, that film and created a very simple looping film. It was um, quite long, very meditative. This is 97, it's before GIFs or any of that. So we actually had to sort of engineer and reverse all the film and video and do the, and created a new age meditative tape called Wind Shear. That was strictly about the border, always displayed on two monitors, one kind of facing north, one kind of facing south, and it just became a meditative uh, tape. Around that time, um, I was suffering from chronic insomnia. And um, my partner, who's my spouse, um, threatened to get me a new age meditation audio, audio tapes to sort of help me go to sleep. You know what I'm talking about, right? So like bubbling brooks or 
tropical birds or uh, waves kind of coming on to the beach. And um, I was involved in all of this sort of artwork that was uh, social and political of nature and just the idea to buy into a kind of new age, uh, new age industry which essentially creates an artificial environment for you to escape your own environment from, right, and project yourself into, right, this other, the other space was a kind of, uh, a kind of a social denial, a kind of escapism that I didn't want to get involved, get involved in. Really, what I didn't want to do was just buy, buy the tape, right? You know, I that was this back in 1998. If I remember correctly, I would actually listen at night to the beginnings of talk radio, conspiracy theories and whatnot that now have developed into what is this larger media of extreme right and left. Uh, uh, a dialogue. So anyway, um, I, uh, after a number of months of threatening me to that I had to have a meditative tape, I made a deal with her, with Barbara, and I said, I will create my own meditative tape. Right? I will create it. And I remembered that I had just recently working with a number of young men and women on the west side of Chicago, uh, conducting interviews with, between rival, uh, rival groups uh, in Humboldt Park, that uh, we were uh, in the midst uh, of one of the interviews on the street. We were caught up on a very proximate, if not directly, at one of the people that we were talking to, a drive-by. And so uh, uh, I know, I knew that back in my archives of all the footage that I had, that I had that analog millisecond of a gunshot. And so I set out and I said, okay, well, I'm going to take that gunshot and I'm going to create a, a meditative tape from that single, single moment. Now, this is before the days of GarageBand. So you, 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 you really couldn't morph individual sounds, nor could you create a kind of randomized event, right? And so as an artist, I now had to associate myself with two people completely out of my field, and one of them was uh, Pablo Noreda, who is a mathematician uh, in, in numbers theories, and he, in a sense, helped set up a fractal equations that would help us take that one bullet and make it into a summer rainstorm. And the other was Paul Dickinson, a sound engineer that would help us take each an individual gunshot and morph it into the different sounds, right? So the culmination of this piece was an 11 minute uh, uh, sound piece that starts with a very loud gunshot, what goes directly to uh, thunder, clapping, and uh, develops a, a storm situation and takes about 11 minutes to uh, retreat, right? And at the very end, the bullets are now sparsed out in some randomized calculation as single gun drops. So 11 minutes, 385,000 repetitions and changes, I have my 11 minute uh, new age meditative piece. And I'm ready, right, to see if it works. So I put it on my Walkman and I put my headphones on and I'm gonna go to sleep and it starts. I know how it starts. It starts with this huge, huge gunshot. And then it moves to the thunderstorm. And then it continues to proceed. And this summer storm now starts to recede. And I find myself getting um, relaxed. And I find myself falling asleep. And I fall asleep. And what I didn't know is that my Walkman was set to auto replay. <laughs> <laughs> so the gunshot goes off again. <laughs> and the next morning, I'm laughing at myself. I'm going, you know, when a thing doesn't work, when I create something that is supposed to work and it doesn't work, maybe it should be art, right? Maybe it should be art. So I have this relationship with utility, usefulness, purposefulness, and art.
right? Um, so, well, maybe it should be art, and that's what it became. It became a piece called Sonambulo, named after, uh, titled after a very famous poem by Federico Garcia Lorca, and it's always installed in wherever museum it is. It needs a lot of day windows, and the galleries are always covered with blue film, and there are speakers, that's the only thing in the gallery are speakers, and the piece goes loops forever in that space. I'm not going to talk very much more about this piece. Search in Busqueda, 2001. So now I return to the border because now I'm asked as an artist to address a particular site of the border, which was in 2001 uh, and still is uh, as to address uh, the U.S. side just south of San Diego and the, uh, in the southern end of the uh, fence with Tijuana in the back and this small town outside of Tijuana called Playa de Tijuana. And what you see here, this line, is the, that fence in, uh, in 2001. Right? Um, and so I'm touring the border and when I get out to play as a Tijuana, we're actually coming with a friend of mine who's an artist, uh, R. Uh, Marcos Ramirez, who goes by R. Because we were coming to one of these little shacks here because they serve really great fresh seafood about 50 feet away from the Pacific Ocean. And while we're eating this, I'm looking at the Pacific Ocean, I'm looking at the wall, and I'm looking at this structure which is a kind of 1950s brutalist piece of architecture, which is the northernmost bullfight ring in the Americas, right? So this is the Plaza Monumental de Toros in Las Playas de Tijuana, a bullfight ring. And it's this mammoth concrete element that sort of just sits there, like if you were to take a speaker, the speaker itself, out of the out of its cabinet and just laid on the table, it would be pointing to the sky. Or you get a better picture of it, right? And I turned to Erre and I said, Mao, maybe I should do something about UFOs. Because I was, I don't know what I'm gonna do here, right? And uh, about two weeks uh, later, I contacted Erre and I said, you know that little joke I mentioned about doing something about UFOs? I think I will. I think I will do it. And so what, uh, what I did uh, for, uh, as part of this commission was to then turn the Plaza do Men do, uh, Monumental de Toros, the bullfight ring in its entirety into a functioning, albeit low-tech, but functioning radio telescope that search the skies for signals, right? So, and what I was trying to do was at the most heavily surveyed area in the United States, which happened to be at that time, that border between San Diego and Tijuana, I wanted to set up the largest surveillance device, except to search for the real aliens, right? So, um, and so the bullfight ring involved a number of people, all sorts of people, historians, architects, sailing engineers, uh, astrophysicists, and so forth. And we created a parabolic dish that covered uh, the tauromachia, which is the sand pit, and we hung above it an antenna, and we searched for the skies. We were doing, we were looking for the, essentially what SETI is looking for for in their array. They're looking for the presence of a particular signal. Does anybody know what signal they're looking for? It's actually an element. They're looking for hydrogen, right? They're looking for the sound wave of hydrogen. And if they then can pinpoint that, then they can begin to study that area and also look for oxygen, because when you get hydrogen and oxygen together, what do you got? Water, and then when we got water, maybe you got life. So that's what SETI is. SETI is this huge network, which is essentially a divining rod, right? Looking for water. You know what I mean by a divining rod, too. Little stick, 
except it's pointing out here and it wants to vibrate. Um, we cleared all the beer advertisements out. We kept the nicknames of the bullfighters and we hung up the antenna and we listened. And underneath the parabolic dish, we placed 75 subwoofers. Essentially what we were getting was what SETI was getting. We were getting static because we were just listening. So we're getting his, but we could pull from that static some components and we funneled that down underneath uh, the radio telescope into subwoofers which took that static and created very deep ohm feedback in the space. So essentially when you walked into the bullfight ring, what you got was just this deep sound waves and we handed everybody hearing protectors and people would come essentially and sort of hang out in the space and they would be inadvertently getting another kind of new age type of thing which is called a deep sonic, no, yeah, no, deep thorax sonic massage. Have you heard of this? Because it really does exist. Using sound waves to massage your internal organs as a form of therapy, right? So this was a kind of, in a sense, a kind of therapeutic site, a monitoring device. And then we took the signal that we received uh, and created a pirate radio station, right? Las Playas de Tijuana is just 20 minutes, 30 minutes north of Ensenada. And Ensenada used to house one of the largest megawatt AM stations in the 1950s. And out of Ensenada operated a DJ, and his name was Wolfman Jack. And Wolfman Jack was projecting from that radio station across the border into the United States this new stuff, really hardcore new stuff called rock and roll. Stuff that wasn't being played in stations in the United States. And he was using Mexico to cross the border with, this, uh, with these signals, which were in a sense music, right? New music. So we set up a pirate radio station here except our pirate radio station, in a sense, broadcast, ours broadcast across the FM spectrum. And we created a transmitter that moved our signal from the lowest end of the FM spectrum to the highest end, and then back. And we do that constantly, slowly move, right? So you never knew where our signal was. And if you thought it was, well, maybe it was just the space between two stations, or it was some strange hiss that occurred in a program. And so the art community came to the art and got something different, which was a deep thorax massage. And the art community knew about the broadcast and would search for it. So then now the search is searching for the art. But they could never be sure that they, they found it. <coughs> About two months into this, um, um, two months into this event, rumors started in Tijuana. And they were started at taco stands and coffee stations. And they were taxi drivers talking to each other. And one would happen to mention, hey, you know, when I'm listening to X, you know, X, XM, uh, XM0, a station, all of a sudden I'm getting a blip. I'm getting an interruption. And the other guy would say, well, I, when I listen to my station, I'm good. Because these guys, right, men and women sit in their taxis, they have the radio on all day to their station, and they're capturing this. And so what happened with this is then a news report came out in one of the Tijuana tabloids. Taxi drivers, right? Taxi, taxi drivers are, uh, are confident that aliens are communicating through the radio. <laughs> the El Nino effect saw, uh, followed uh, actually it was previous to search. 1997 becomes really important for me 
because it's when the issue of climate and immigration get kind of mixed up in a very interesting way. In 1997, before the media that we have in terms of on your laptops and whatnot, we had cable television and broadcast television. And in 1997, it was the first time that you found an anchor, lead anchors, talking about weather. And what they were talking about was the El Nino effect. Because in 1997, it was huge and it was scary. Right? This, this hot water in the southern Pacific of South America creating systems that move north, again, into our area and wreak havoc and change. But 1997 was also when uh, uh, what hit the news was the, the undocumented people crossing the border. So it was the first time that we as a culture had these images you know, being played back to us. And you found that daily updates on the El Nino effect were either followed by or preceded by uh, news on, on immigration. The El Nino effect is, base, is, is, uh, is, an, is an English term, um, but it uh, was coined, the El Nino was coined by a, a Dominican priest, a colonial priest in, at the time of uh, the colonization of South America. And he would call it El Nino because it happened in December, and he was talking about a small child, and he was referring as a, as a priest, as a Catholic priest, he was referring to the Christ child, albeit a very colicky child, right? That would disrupt and cause problems, right? But the El Nino effect as a term already carries a kind of otherness here because it's in a different language and it's a boy and that boy moving north causes an effect, right? Um, in a sense, the El, Nino, the El Nino for the Dominican priest was a phenomena that was occurring, but the El Nino effect is that phenomena, but conjoined with, um, conjoined with a new sort of uh, um, uh, a new sort of uh, focus on the border becomes essentially not only a weather system, but a brown child, a brown child crossing north, right? Um, and so I created an installation called the El Nino Effect, and it turned a museum at one point, and then a gallery at another point to a fully functioning uh, sensory deprivation spa, where you could go and float, you know, in sensory deprivation tanks, you essentially float in basically something very similar to the water in the South Pacific during a Nino effect. It's water temperature at your body temperature, so it's pretty high, and it's salinated, so you float. And then you're sealed there in complete darkness, and you have an hour and a half session of, what you're looking at it, I'm saying, seriously, I never participated in my own installation. <laughs> I could never be in, by, it's not that I couldn't be in a dark place Right, enclosed, but I just don't think I could be any, anywhere just with myself and just with my thoughts. <laughs> so, uh, huh? When was this? This was in 1990. Where? Well, this one is a gallery in Santa Monica, California, but it was first shown at the museum called Art Pace in San Antonio. And uh, the uh, uh, what ha what's necessary with this installation is that it's actually two rooms, the installation and the sculpture, and then the second gallery actually gets converted into a shower room. Yeah. Are those TVs in the back showing the? the right, right. And so what I did in this kind of sort of relaxation space, I put up wind shear. Remember the clouds over the border, and the sound playing in the gallery was Sonambulo, the summer rainstorm. So it had a whole sort of package, video, sound, and experience, and um, there it is, right? And the other gallery was always outfitted as a fully functioning shower room. 
It meant we had to have a tendons, and it meant that we had to do a lot of laundry as part of the art exhibition, all right? You were asked to take a shower to remove your body oils, and then you would be granted another shower with clean towels to remove all the salt from you, right? The only condition that I placed on my, on my uh, in participation uh, in my installation for these free sessions was that you couldn't do it alone. You always had to do it with somebody else. You had to pair your experience. So you had to find your best friend or your partner or your psychiatrist <laughs> or your brother to you would get in one tank and they would get in the other. That was the only thing. And we had in both places fully booked waiting lists. And we always had to leave a slot of uh, open slots for people who couldn't find a partner. So there was a kind of matching. People got on information sites and they would kind of match up. Hey, I, need, I want to float. Will somebody float with me? Because they could, weren't allowed to float. And then I created a series of photographs called, this one called Nina and Nina. This one called Nina and Nino. Uh, this one called Nino and Nina. And that one called Nino and, and Nino, right? So basically, I was kind of in, interested in this kind of metaphor of this sort of climate metaphor. One gallery had low-lying, heavy, warm, salinated water that through participation is cycled into the shower with the rain of, of fresh water. And this cycle sort of continues and drives itself during, uh, during the exhibition. How am I doing on time? I'm doing fine? Yeah. All right. So um, I, started, um, I started to think about the El Nino effect. And at this time, I was working on, um, I was working on um, a project that was a film on Robert Oppenheimer. And it was a film on Robert Oppenheimer. It was meant to be a portrait of him after he was exiled from the Atomic Energy C Committee for being critical of further development of, of, uh, of escalation of scientific knowledge up above and beyond the atomic bomb, which he was in part responsible for. So then you have this tricky figure of Oppenheimer, who in a sense is also straddling a border, and for many people, Afterwards, it was this complicated figure, right? Who was, in a sense, responsible for something catastrophic and yet became a kind of conscience for those, uh, for those. And so this is the beginning, actually Oppenheimer, beginning of a kind of, uh, the beginnings of an anti-war movement very early, early on. Uh, and I, what I wanted to do with this film of Oppenheimer, which I did, which I won't show, and then I wanted to have this beautiful, sculpture of the Trinity explosion. You know, so I was looking at all the films and we were modeling them, the films in Rhino and creating a beautiful plume, right? And then I just said, I can't, I really can't do this because this is not the type of work I do. I'm not a traditional sculptor that takes a block of marble and finds the soul within it. I don't will forms into being. I'm more interested in finding natural phenomena that may have, in a strange way, their own wills, even if it's a storm, and then using it or displacing it to talk about something else. And after a long time, about nine months, I talked to a colleague down at UIC Urbana, and uh, who happened to be a meteorologist heading up a very sophisticated modeling group called the Convective Modeling Group, and he said, well, Inigo, you know, if instead of the Trinity explosion, we could get you a moment that is very close and very powerful, right? Would you be able to use that? And I said, yeah. And he said, ah, well, we're tracking cumulonimbus thunderstorms and supercell thunderstorms. And we have an event. Uh, we're set up on a kind of an international basis meteorologists to track an event in Illinois when it occurs and then dump all that information in the Beckman supercomputer and then all use that information. Why don't you come down? 
it once we tracked that event. And that's what happened. And, and so essentially the sculpture that came out of it that, that paired itself up with the film on Oppenheimer was not a mushroom cloud, but a cumulonimbus cloud, right? Cumulonimbus is like the cloud that all clouds aspire to be. <laughs> it, it, it gets very close to the ground and goes up very high and it's the most destructive, but also the most productive of the clouds. And this is one moment in that storm, and it's actually the data from what I call the muscle of the storm. It's looking for the vortex forces so you don't get this nice shape. And uh, it becomes a kind of a machined cloud made with a, a kind of a, tat a titanium alloy foil, almost old world gold leafing on this very abstract shape. And here it is installed in a, in a museum, right? And then Oppenheimer's film is over here. Oppenheimer it was a, I found a friend of mine who looked like Oppie. I won't go into that story, but we put him in Garfield Park. There's a beautiful conservatory there called, by, designed by Jen Jensen and it's called the Fern Room. If you can go to Garfield Park Conservatory on the west side of Chicago, look for the Fern Room. It's a 1906, and we went and we put Oppenheimer on the water. We had some milk crates and plexi sheets, and he waded out in trout fisherman outfits, and then with the help of my assistant, he got up on top, fully dry, on top of the, the water, and then we made a film where we kind of just sort of um, orbited Oppenheimer in this prehistoric uh, space. So anyway, uh, Oppenheimer is a film that usually plays with cloud prototype number one. Um, cloud prototype number six. This is a lenticular lenticularis, right, which is a cloud it looks like a lens, hence the name, and they occur in alpine situations on the leeward side. And they're usually very benign unless you see two of them, then pilots stay away from that. And uh, this was a cloud for Zurich Airport. I couldn't give them the cumulus thunderstorm. It would be bad luck, so I gave them one uh, lenticularis. And sometimes they have holes. Sometimes they're donuts. It just looks like a UFO. So suddenly I'm back to UFOs. Right? And this is a cloud that you can experience below, at cloud level, and above. And it's also a confounding object because, you know, you talked about confounding these. Uh, that my clouds are these things that, what is it? And then maybe maybe you'll get a little information on it later. This is a, a last piece, which is not in the series of cloud prototypes, which is not really a cloud data, but working with Texas A&M College of Engineering, they commissioned a piece for their new building, which is like enormous, just for undergraduates. So all of you guys doing PhDs would, would not be able to work in this building. But in any case, this was uh, thinking about forces uh, hydrodynamic forces that I've been using in other work. And, but the forces I was looking for were on a galactic scale. I was interested in these two binary stars and this moment in which this galactic gas since pushed itself onto this binary system stars and started to create a large bow wave. And so we calculated very simply by looking at that bow wave and drawing the parabola, which is the bow right, that was being caused by the gases and using that parabola then to create uh, this, this sculpture. It's about 40 feet high and hangs just above your head in a very large atrium and it's the entrance to the College of Engineering. And it's called a prototype for stellar interloper or parenthetically silver surfer, right? Because we're talking about galactic forces 
and I have a 17-year-old son who's crazy about Marvel, so he always called it Silver Surfer, and I thought, well, you know what's going to happen? All the kids in college, all the freshmen and sophomores are going to begin to nickname this thing. Maybe I'll nickname before then. I'm actually kind of running out of time, right? Yeah, I think we want questions. Yeah, so yeah. Let's, let's do some questions. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Diego. Do we have questions about anything? Yes. Now, I'm deaf, so Malcolm will hear it and he'll help me. I, I can talk loudly, too. Um, so you said kind of your job is to point. OK, I can talk. Hello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said your job is to point at different things that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also talking about these huge, large-scale projects that are collaborations with cities and engineers and scientists. So I'm wondering what order those things come in if you have something you want to draw attention to and then you start building a team together to make this happen or if you have a relationships with these different people and say okay what with these relationships what can we like what kind of art can we create from these what kind of art well i mean you know, i'll show you like for example during the afghan war i wanted to point to something when our initial entry of it I keep seeing images of canadian Allied forces, US forces in fields of poppies, right? And then there's a whole history of that, of that poppy and the culture of the poppy and the fact that it's genetically constructed by us humans, right? And so at this point, I wanted to point to it, but I couldn't point to it because I wasn't there. So I went through a series of asking a series of AP photographers who were in the field. I said, could you give me an image of a poppy, and could you shoot it in night vision, right? And so there's a kind of simple sort of pointing there, right? And that, that begins, that begins a, a, a larger project, which is an installation in which the images of the poppy are only visible if there's actually a projection of them in the room. So it's kind of a live thing. And what I'm interested here in pointing is the fact that for this ins for that that installation, the poppy, the somniferum popovero, again sleeping poppy. I'll go back to this theme of, of sleep uh, exists in the space, but you can't see it until the projection actually starts. This was in MoMA, so here the security guard actually was coached by me on how to start the projection. He had to take a big lighter. I just had a big lighter with me. And he'd click it just once, and that night vision camera would see a little spark of light. It's pointing to a whole mess of poppies in the room, and it would begin the projection. And then the projection would start to light the poppies, and it would escalate until it got to this dramatic sort of... Uh, sort of moment. So you never knew, right? Okay, we ne you never knew that. So it was this idea of the object, the object, right, being in a sense pointed to and scrutinized by its own image. And what I was trying to get to was a kind of notion of how do we create, right, a moment in which we can launch a whole mess of people into in a, a large event, in this case, war, right? You know, um, we, there's a complex sort of way in which power uses image, right? To create a thing that may not exist and then delivers it to us and that becomes a kind of an engineering of what essentially is an escalation of a movement, right? So in the, in, I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, so in like the epic Gilgamesh, right? It was Gilgamesh the king and his friend Enkidu. And there was this moment in which Gilgamesh gives this soliloquy, which is basically he's trying to convince Enkidu of going into the uh, forest of Lebanon and murder the god Umbaba. So this is basically the first sort of like preemptive war. There was nothing. Umbaba wasn't hurting anybody. And so what it, Gilgamesh does is create an image first of Umbaba 
and then uses that image in talking and language to convince Enkidu to go with him and kill Umbaba. So I'm working on, I was working on that, how that works, right? You had a question back there. I don't think I answered your question, though. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was interesting. <laughs> so why don't we need a weatherman? Excuse me? So why don't we need a weatherman? Why don't we need, oh, well, that's a series of work that I'm talking about. Um, why don't we need a weatherman is, um, uh, is, is a line from a song by Bob Dylan. And the song's called uh, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues. You know it, right? Okay? And it says, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Right? And the song is about a response to power and politics at that time. I think it was 19, mid-60s, maybe 67, 1967. So, um, <clears throat> and you don't need a weatherman, which is another series of works which I won't show. What I'm talking about is uh, I an overly complicated debate over what is sometimes just obvious. And that might be a debate on climate change, right? Or it might be a debate on politics, right? And at some point or another, all the instruments that you use to gather all the data and actually look at the situation may not be necessary if we just use common sense. So you don't need a weatherman, in a sense, refers to that, right? Um, but it only refers to that because I'm an artist, so I can't tell you why we don't need a weatherman. I can just say it and let it hang up there in the air. Any other question? Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> so I'm really interested with the whole um, idea of how you created the, um, the structure in the bullfighting ring and mm -hmm. then people ultimately interacted with it in a way that was them explaining it by alien interactions. Um, and so I was wondering, if, was that originally part of the intent of the piece? Or is that just an interesting effect of how people interacted with the art, um, with the scanning through the radio stations? If you do public art, you have to let go of it, right? Because it's now in the public. And, and the public is going to interact with it in ways that are unpredictable. Um, but if you do the right things, you can create a situation for experience that is a kind of a phenomenological rather than just optical experience of the work. You are here in the same place at the same time with this object of art. What is the situation? And what, how does it affect me and how do I affect it? And so that's a kind of thing. And it's unpredictable. And, and, and sometimes it's unintentional, you know. Uh, this, this piece um, called Phantom Truck was a piece that the idea came to me while I was listening in 2003, in February 2003, to Colin Powell, Secretary of State, General Colin Powell, address the UN Security Council and provide a series of slides and rationale for why we should go into Iraq. And one of the series of rationale is because Iraq was deploying mobile biological weapons in trains and in trucks and moving them around and hiding them. And so I'm listening to this live, and as an artist, I say to myself, it doesn't exist. It's a fabrication. This is all fabrication. But I'm going to build that truck. I'm going to build that truck. And many years later, after building and doing all the research, I build it. And then what I do is I hide it. A very famous exhibition. I get this huge gallery. I make sure very little light, if at all any light enters in the room, and we construct a full-scale mobile biological weapons truck that is actually, guess what, was proved not to be a, 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 a biological lab, but was proved to actually be portable devices that would take water and convert it to 
hydrogen. In this case, hydrogen for weather balloons or artillery balloons. Nonetheless, I took that truck and built it in the space. And when you came in, you would have about 30 or 40 seconds before you could begin to even maybe perhaps see it or think you saw it, right? And there it would appear to yourself. What I couldn't, didn't have the intention, I didn't couldn't realize, is that people still didn't believe it was there. They thought it was some sort of big hologram. And, um, and because I had also created a rumor as the artist in this big exhibition that it really wasn't there. We didn't put anything in there. So I spread that rumor, but it was there. And so then very early on in the exhibition, if not the next day, I met with all the curators and security and I said, you have to let the public touch this piece because in the art world you don't touch paintings or anything. And then what started to happen is people would walk up to it and touch it. Right? Um, so that's kind of like a, uh, a you know, uh, yeah, a non intended situation that actually kind of strengthens the piece. Because now I don't, now in terms of creating the image of war, right, in order to unleash a rationale to go forward, I don't create a piece that depends on technology to light itself up, right? So in the previous piece, I had the military uh, night vision lenses connected to the projector, and there was a strange relationship between them, the object, and the image, right? And one that I still don't, don't quite understand, you know, where I'm going with it. But in Phantom Truck, there's no technology. But there is an apparatus to view it. And that's you, right? That's you. So it's your own physical apparatus, time and experience of that, of sightlessness to then sighting that makes it appear, right? So Phantom, which in Latin um, etymology means a kind of an apparition or a ghost. In the original Greek, phantom was really a kind of word that was not a noun, but always a verb. To make appear, to make visible, right? So whether it's an illusion or real. And what I was interested in, in the viewer, was a moment in which they might if they knew about the work. Some people came in and saw nothing. Some people came in and said, oh, a truck. But boy, that was pretty cool. I didn't, you know? And some people said, oh, it's a truck, but it's a fabrication of that first fabrication, right? Um, but what I was interested in is that some people might get to the point where they themselves, right, are inextricably tied right, to the apparatus that makes the fabrication of a fabrication visible. In other words, the, the public itself in one way, in one manner, enters into kind of collusion with this kind of fabrication, with propaganda, right? You know, and we are seeing this play itself out continuously now. To what extent are we part of the apparatus of the making? Not maybe of the fact, the thing, but the image. Because what we're debating nowadays is actually the image of the thing and not the facts. But even the critics are taking sort of positions in which they partake in sort of the construction of that apparition, right? So that's what I'm interested in. Sometimes, and it depends on the work. We have to end it there, but let's thank Inigo for. I can't hear.